postpone the surgery, right? Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not very successful, but uh, I'll present some data how we approach uh, uh, the conservative topic of the therapy. So uh, the slides which I will present today will be available on these two websites. So if you want to share them or repeat them, uh, you're more than welcome. The, uh, we have free access. Okay. So uh, we'll talk briefly about what is osteoarthritis and how we can distinguish osteoarthritis from other forms of arthritis. And then we'll talk about uh, latest therapy and what we do in our clinic. And at the end, if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer on all the questions. So uh, first of all, uh, if we look at arthritis in general, uh, there are two larger groups. Uh, one group is inflammatory arthritis, and the second group is non-inflammatory arthritis or degenerative arthritis, which typically represent the uh, consequence of uh, sort of wear and tear. So how, would it, how do we define what is osteoarthritis is? So first of all, osteoarthritis is defined as a disease of uh, joints where we see cartilage loss. Uh, we see changes in the bone under the cartilage, so-called subchondral bone. Uh, we see also changes in tendons and ligaments surrounding the bones. Uh, we, as a consequence, uh, obviously, you know, misalignment of the joints to happen and uh, the end stage of the disease uh, is the loss of joint function. So, uh, again, inflammation takes place in osteoarthritis, but it's more kind of mechanical, or rather systemic inflammation. So, uh, what do you feel when you have uh, osteoarthritis? Uh, well, first of all, it's pain after physical activity. It's a joint swelling, it's a joint stiffness. Uh, finally, it's a loss of joint flexibility and eventually changes in joint appearance and joint deformities. And here you can see uh, basically a knee a joint affected by osteoarthritis and hand joints affected by osteoarthritis. Uh, in general, osteoarthritis can affect any particular joint in our body without any exceptions. So, uh, what are the general principles? <coughs> so, basically, there are three main principles. Number one, uh, we need to control pain and inflammation. So, uh, number two, uh, if we can, we should prevent uh, cartilage degeneration. And number three, ideally, ideally, we should restore the joint function. So, uh, these are the three main uh, topics which we're going to focus on. So, how do we control inflammation and pain? So there are a variety of options available. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as uh, NSAIDs. So these drugs include well-recognized names such as ibuprofen and aproxen, and uh, also uh, latest addition would be Celebrex, which is a COX-2 inhibitor. So these drugs, they work mainly on inflammatory component and through inflammation they control pain. Most of these drugs, uh, should not be used on a long-term basis because uh, they can cause some pretty serious side effects, including uh, bleeding uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, including uh, hypertension, and including kidney failure. Uh, but again, for the short term, these are safe drugs. Acetaminophen, uh, also known as Tylenol, uh, is a bit safer, but it provides a bit less kind of pain control compared to NSAIDs. Uh, opioid analgesics, which include Vicodin, Percocet, and other morphine-derived drugs, uh, is kind of another option for uh, very intense pain. And finally, there are uh, some alternative options, uh, such as uh, injections of hyaluronic acid, uh, known as visceral supplementation therapy, uh, food supplements, physical therapy, and bionic ear device. So bionic ear device, uh, it's a modality which no one knows how to classify it, it's basically a device uh, which you wear at night time. It generates electrical current which kind of suppresses inflammation and you need to wear it for approximately three or four months before you notice a difference. So it's some kind of home-based device, but right now it's categorized under physical therapy devices. So how we can prevent uh, cartilage loss and cartilage degeneration? Again, uh, injections of hyaluronic acid, food supplements, that's basically, these are two main th stream things. 
the next topic is restoring joint function. Again, food supplements, hyaluronic acid injection, physical therapy, and orthotics, which include bracing uh, of the affected joints. So uh, today we'll talk briefly about uh, viscous supplementation therapy. So this is the therapy which is a form of injectable therapy and it's based on injections of hyaluronic acid. So there are approximately five or six different brands available uh, with exception of one brand. Most of the products are uh, derived from rooster combs and the only product which is 100% uh, bi-identical is the products which uh, produced by Fering, and uh, the name of the product is Euflexa. So, uh, indication for hyaluronic injections include joint pain and joint deformities uh, due to osteoarthritis, and uh, relative contraindications include uh, joint inflammation uh, due to some underlying inflammatory condition, as well as gout, a calcium deposit in the joints, and joint infection. So, uh, when we start uh, injecting joints with hyaluronic acid, uh, a lot of time our patients ask us, how do we know that I will respond? How do we know that you know, I will benefit? So, in general, if we look kind of globally, the success rate with uh, hyaluronic acid injections roughly in the vicinity of 70 to 75 percent. So, uh, people with mild to moderate joint deformities, meaning mild to moderate osteoarthritis, they have much higher rate to benefit. Uh, those who have uh, advanced disease have obviously low rate. Uh, those who have a large joint fluid or joint infusion, infusions, they have also uh, slightly low rate to benefit as compared to those who have so-called dry joints. So also what we notice in our practice, uh, people with muscle atrophy don't benefit from that as well as those compared to well-preserved muscles. And uh, finally, people with unstable joints, meaning that the joint goes kind of back and forth and wiggle, also have relatively low uh, chances to benefit. And these are the patients which typically need to have surgery. So also success rate uh, of the uh, viscous supplementation therapy depends on which joints we're, uh, we're planning to inject. In general, in the United States, uh, the therapy approved only for the knees but off the label, we use it for any particular joint you can imagine. In Europe, uh, the drug is, all these drugs are approved just for osteoarthritis without any specific, in, terms of, in, in regards to the uh, joint anatomy. So in our practice, we inject, practically speaking, any joint with uh, hyaluronic acid, and based on our experience and published data, the three joints have the highest success rate, obviously knees, base of the thumb, right around here, which is first CMC joint, and TMJs. So these are the joints which have the highest success rate. In my practice, I would say number one is a TMJ, uh, number two is a base of the thumb, and number three is a knee. What is TMJ? Temporal mandible joint. It's a joint which basically uh, in your face is part of your jaw, right? So, uh, moderate success rate, so I've done enough uh, hips and ankles, and basically in our clinic we see very advanced cases, and success rate kind of moderate, I would say around 50-50. So I typically don't push my patients to have injections in the hip and ankles. And shoulders, I've never been very successful with shoulders, I injected enough in the past, and my success rate less than 10 to 25%. So again, it may be because I do see very advanced cases of osteoarthritis, but in general, in general, I don't recommend to use this therapy for osteoarthritis of the shoulders. So, uh, how we can optimize the uh, lubrication therapy or hyaluronic acid therapy? So, first of all, we need to reduce inflammation before injections, and for this purpose, we typically use steroid injections right before the uh, hyaluronic acid injections. Uh, the joints needs to be dry, meaning if you have a fluid in the joint, uh, the fluid needs to be drained. Otherwise, the drug gets diluted and the effect goes down. So, uh, again, uh, the next step is selection of the right agent. So, right now, there are five or six agents available on the market, and so you need to talk to a physician to discuss which agent uh, will benefit you the most. And next thing is, a lot of physicians, which is a shame, I think, in our community, don't use ultrasound, which is uh, actually approved by American College of Rheumatology right now as the tool to guide joint injections. 
because if you do injections in a blind way, you never know where you are with the needle. So in our clinic, all injections are done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, we've been doing it for over 10 years, and we have great success rate with that. So, uh, and I would strongly recommend to check with your physician to be sure that the injections are done under appropriate guidance. So the next thing is, it's another mistake which commonly uh, seen in our practices is that after the injection, all the injected joints need to be immobilized. What it means, you're not supposed to do much on the day of injection because otherwise uh, the drug is getting pushed uh, out of the joint and you won't get any benefits. So immobilization after the injection is a must. And finally, to optimize the outcome, recommend uh, physical therapy after, continue, after completion of the injection cycle, food supplement, and sometimes, uh, and we'll talk about that later, uh, platelet-rich plasma therapy as a part of treatment protocol. So uh, back to the ultrasound. So why do we use ultrasound in our practice? Well, first of all, you can see uh, joint anatomy right away at the bedside. Uh, number two, it's absolutely safe. Uh, so you don't expose to any radiation or any kind of environmental problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ultrasound helps you to avoid some kind of undesirable or unexpected findings. Crystals, uh, inflammation tendons, uh, difficult kind of to recognize uh, effusions uh, or fluid accumulation. So it guarantees that the drug will get into the joint space and not somewhere else. And plus, patients will be very, very comfortable when you see during the procedure that the drug was in the right <coughs> space. Right? And so I'll show you, for example, a case from our practice. So uh, I try to uh, talk to a patient to basically aspirate the joint, and the patient said, you know what, my leg feels very swollen. And I've been to several physicians, I don't know why it's swollen. So we put a probe and did the ultrasound, and so I'll show you. Uh, it was kind of very unusual discovery, so this is a popliteal cyst, so filled with the fluid, and this is popliteal artery. So in this particular patient, uh, the fluid from the joint was actually collapsing the artery, and the leg gets swollen because of that. So it's a common kind of example of what we can see on ultrasound, and how ultrasound can help us to guide our therapy. So uh, this is an example of ultrasound guidance. So we can see that uh, this is the knee, uh, this is the fluid in the knee, and this is the needle. So actually you can see things in real time, and you can see that after uh, completion, the joint is completely dry, and then we can inject the hyaluronic acid right in the joint. So, uh, same thing is true for other joints. So, this is an example of the hip, uh, which we typically inject uh, under ultrasound guidance. So, uh, after we complete the cycle of viscous pigmentation therapy or hyaluronic acid injections, uh, typically we discuss with our patients what else can be done to optimize the therapy. And the next step typically is uh, based on food supplements. So what kind of food supplements are available for osteoarthritis? Probably most of you know about glucosamine. <coughs> However, most of the clinical trials with glucosamine show that it doesn't work. So uh, the three major trials performed by the National Institute of Health around five or 10 years ago show that it works equal to placebo. So it's not worth using it at all. So in my practice, there's very small percentage of patients who do benefit from glucosamine, but majority don't feel any benefits at all. So what's been shown to benefit? Uh, so there are certain drugs which actually do work. Not drugs, but food supplements, I'm sorry. So number one is chondroitin sulfate. So number two, MSM. Uh, number three, N-acetyl glucosamine, which is a modified glucosamine. And finally, a couple of products which are extremely popular in Japan, and they became popular here several years ago, is oral hyaluronic acid and oral collagen type two. So all these ingredients, uh, what they do, Upon absorption, uh, they produce kind of uh, nutrients for your cartilage, and uh, what's been shown in animals and in humans is that the cartilage gets thicker. So don't expect that defects in the cartilage will get repaired. It doesn't happen, but the cartilage gets thicker. So we have a thicker cushion, and so it improves actually mechanics of the joints. So the next group of uh, food supplements which we're using are the food supplements which can help you with pain and inflammation. 
So uh, they include beswele and curcumin, and curcumin is a component of turmeric. So uh, these products uh, are prescription products in Europe, and they're used here as food supplements. Uh, very important topic is uh, why they don't work sometimes and why they do work in other cases. So uh, the answer based on the dose. So with food supplements, you need to go to pretty high dose to see the effects. So like in case of asphalic curcumin, we're talking about several grams a day before you see the difference. The second thing, uh, they don't work right away. So if you take ibuprofen and naproxen, you expect to see the difference instantly. With food supplements, be patient for three or four days. And once they kick in, you have much more prolonged uh, mode of action. They work for much, much longer than just over-the-counter uh, painkillers. Uh, Devil's Claw is another very popular product uh, in our clinic, and it's another product which is prescribed in Europe. It's by prescription only. So it's an extract from South African herb. So uh, in many clinical trials and in many peer-reviewed scientific publications, Devil's Claw was similar to ibuprofen in terms of anti-inflammatory activity, but much, much safer. And then, obviously, fish oil uh, being used. Again, with fish oil, you need to go to pretty high dose to see uh, the beneficial effect. For pain, for example, you need to go up to 6 to 8 grams, or 6 to 8,000 milligrams a day of fish oil to see benefits for pain. A creel oil, uh, which is getting very popular in the States now, uh, is more by a kind of effective, biologically effective than the fish oil, but still you need to go to three or four grams a day, or three or four thousand milligrams a day to see the benefits. And uh, several years ago, there was a splash of activity uh, in terms of green leaf muscle extract. Uh, it's an extract from New Zealand green leaf muscle. And uh, again, we do use it in our practice, but I'm not thrilled about that, so I don't see any difference between uh, this particular product, which is very expensive, and creole oil. So, uh, the next group of uh, supplements are supplements for viscoelasticity. What does it mean? These are lubricants. So, uh, you can get uh, some lubricating effect by taking oral hyaluronic acid and by taking celadrine. And celadrine